morning, New Dawn. How are you doing today? All right. Um, you know, as we were singing this last song and just just thinking about how wonderful, how amazing our God is, I was, I was holding um, this bottle of water. I often get two of these on Sundays just because I don't want to have my throat to be dry. Uh, first service, second service. And I thought, it's perspective in life. And, and I thought, wow, this was just handed to me. Walter just handed it to me. But yet a week ago, I was scrambling to, to find these things. I was scrambling from the stores to, to make sure that my family had enough and everybody uh, around me and, and so forth. And, and, and so many of us maybe don't even realize what, what we just went through. And I, I was thinking about that, and, and I, I just feel responsible to tell you this, but all of us are in social media. And there's so many crazy stuff out there that we need to understand. We need to understand. You know, I, as I was looking at this and, and, and thought of the images that came out of Key West eventually during the week, and people were just standing there saying, please tell somebody we have no water, we have no food, we have nothing. We have nothing. My mind went as far back as, as, as Andrew. For some of you, you weren't even possibly even born during that time. And, and the same images I remember on TV from South Miami. And yet, because it spared us in many ways, so what do we lose? Electricity for a few days, some still don't have it. Because maybe we lost, I don't know, a fence, a tree. As Christians, we dared to make the comments or even the statements or even the judgments. Hey, <laughs> you know, we prayed. We went out to the beach, a group of people. Prayed here in Miami Beach that the storm would leave and go to the west side. And then praise God that the storm actually moved to the west of Florida. Is it possible that my God all of a sudden became a, a God of favorites? Is it possible that my God decided to stand in the balcony of heaven and said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and just mess those people from the west coast of Florida like I did with Houston because I had nothing better to do while I also destroyed the keys. Is that the God that we serve? Guys, as Christians, when we see that, that is wrong. That is not the God that we serve. That's not the God that we serve that sits up there in heaven and decides where to guide these things and, and, and he sends them as judgments just because he has nothing better to do. No, no, and because we are Christians, because we say we love God and we make those kind of statements whether it's on Facebook or whatever else or even out loud to, to, out loud to family and friends, hence this is why the people that don't know God don't want anything to do with us. Let's not present our God that way. And while God, through, through the history of the Bible, have used the climate and, the, and, and, and everything as judgment, this is not how he works. Understand one thing. From the moment Adam and Eve fell, sin came into the world and damaged everything. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that everything is broken, including nature. And these things happen. And at the end of the day, bad things happen to good people. So while we pray and we thank God, let's also pray and pray and pray for the needs of those that are before us right now. They don't need judgment. What they need is love. What they need is love. But by the grace of God, we stand here today. Someone else posted and said, oh, the keys the keys got the greatest judgment. You know why? Because the majority of the people there are homosexuals. I wanted to go through and I wanted to just kill. What does one thing have to do with the other? How wrong is to make those kind of statements? You ever hear anybody say that to you? Stand up and reject that. 
That's not the way our God works. That's not the way He is. That's not what He does. What we need to do now is go wherever we're needed to help those that need it, regardless of where they are in their walk of life. Because of this, I said this in the first service, and this has nothing to do with my message. I just needed to tell you that because it's really been burning. I don't want anybody here to think that way. Someone in the first service who, who deals with mental health was telling me that. He's in the hotline. And he said, it's amazing what you just said because he said, just got a call from a couple from down the Keys who are a homosexual couple who were scared to death that nobody would help them. They've lost everything, 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 just because they read that people were not helping those that were in that condition. This is wrong. This is wrong. It has nothing to do with sexual orientation, nothing to do with politics, it has nothing to do with race, nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with people, people like you and I, we were spared this time, but we don't know that we will the next. Man, let's just, let's just show Christ for who Christ is. Let's show, he came here to seek and to save that which was lost. And one day, you and I were in that condition of being lost, and he saved us for that reason alone, if no other. Amen. Let's show love. Let's show concern. And let's be there. Today, um, after the service, I'm going to be meeting with, with uh, someone I knew for a long time over at Day Christian. I was a teacher there. He lives in the Keys. He got out uh, to, to weather the storm, but he's coming through today and going back to the Keys. And he was saying how he's not even sure if he's got a house when he gets there, but he knows some of the people that uh, live there. They have lost everything. I want to see what I can do for him personally. Over at the uh, West Coast, uh, uh, someone from the first service that, that we know of, um, they have a cousin that lives there, and she was reporting to her that even though she was spared, she said there is a, adjacent to where she lives, is a, a, an area where there's a lot of trailers of where uh, illegals live at who are, have lost almost everything and are afraid to speak up, to ask for anything they're, because of their condition. You done? We need to be there. We need to be there. This is what this is, what this is all about. I, 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 I'm taken back that these kind of things bring out the best in some people, but man, it brings out the worst in some. There's some crazy people out there. And, and I get angry at that, and then I think, human nature, man, human nature at its worst. So let's just... Man, let's just stay true to what we know is right. Let's stay committed, committed to what we said we would do. And that's what I'm going to be talking for the next few minutes. Commitment. Let's recommit. Let's recommit to our values. That's all that happens. When you see this craziness and the way people react and we, and we go, I don't understand why people react that way. I don't understand why people go around looting and taking away. I don't understand that. Well, listen, this is simple. All they're doing is just showing outwardly the values that they have inward. And in some, they have none. Let's recommit. Let's recommit. And so with that in mind, that was my little soapbox stuff. <laughs> Some of you in school heard about Cortez, that Spanish explorer that went off to Mexico and explored whatever. This legend that when he got there in one of his you know, exploring tours, I call them, when he got there, he told his people to get off the ship, and as they got on shore, he said, before we take another step, I want you to turn around, go back, and burn the ships. Interesting. 
They burned the ships. Why would that be? Because there was no way back. You've made a commitment to come and explore and conquer, so therefore we're always going to go forward. You made a commitment to do what you said you were going to do, and you're going to do it. And just so that you don't have another way out, you're going to burn away what's the only possibility of leaving. Amen? Amen? So here's what's going on. We haven't done that in our lives. <laughs> we haven't burnt, I, as I was, we we're going to read earlier, uh, later, our gods. We haven't burned those things that are really holding us back from our commitment that we made to God. So I want to refresh our mind on that because here's the lesson to all this. Retreat will always be easy when you have an option. I mean, we, we can say, I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to step back. I'm never going to retreat. I'm never going to stop this. But when you have an option, you're going to explore that option. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to burn those ships, all those options, and say, we're going and moving forward and forward only as a commitment. Take marriage, for example. I read somewhere, I thought it was a little comic strip, but in many cases, this is, this is really true. A, a man was speaking to a friend, and he said, you know, I just got engaged uh, to get married. And it's funny that after I got engaged, I am getting more and more scared. Have you, have you guys have experienced that? Don't say if you have. And the other man replied to that. This is where I thought it was interesting. He said, man, I know exactly what you mean. You see, it's only natural to get nervous because, you see, marriage is a big commitment. Seven or eight years is a long time. <laughs> and for some people, honestly, unfortunately, they go into this commitment for like, uh, hey, I haven't burned all my ships, and you know what? I got an option. I have an option. If this doesn't work out, I'm out. I am out. In fact, we live more and more and more in a society that people are really thinking or rethinking marriage. They're just saying, why do it? I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, why go to a pastor or to the justice of peace or wherever you go and you sign a little, all you do is sign a little paper, a little license that says we're committed legally and then something happens and I'm going to have to give this person half of my money. So why do it? You know, it's getting to that, to that, to that point in, in life. So commitment is getting to be a, a, something of the past, something that really, who cares? I remember when Judy and I got married. Yes, yeah, very long. Thir 38 years, I think, this year. Wow. December 15th of this year, 38 years. So when we got married, we said to each other, amongst other things, is our commitment, part of our commitment was we would never use the D word. In fact, we would never use the entire word. We just said the D word. So you guys know what that means, right? So we never, you know, I'm sure, I am sure I've given Judy plenty of reasons to use the D word. But, but she hasn't used it yet. I, I figured the day she uses the D, she'll use the complete thing. So it's... We said we would never, no matter what, commitment is no matter what, no matter what we go through, we're just never going to use that option just because it's out there. I don't want to live by the creed of, I want to keep my options open. That's what's happening today. Oh man, I, I, I'm going to get into this, but I'll keep my options open. I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to keep my options open. I'm going to commit to this in church, but I'm going to keep my options open. I'm going to commit to this relationship, but I'll keep my options open. That's not commitment, my friend. And so the question is, why? What's happening with commitment? Well, I, I think a couple of things really quick. Past experiences, I, I think. Some people don't want to commit because, man, they, they, they had some really, really, really bad relationships in the past. I mean, nasty. I mean, you, you have some friends that, that just really, really messed you up. I mean, they stabbed you in the... Heck, they didn't even stab you in the back. You saw them coming. They stabbed you right in your face. I mean, those people, you go like... Why even bother entering into another? Why look for another friend? I'd rather just take my chances by myself. Why even? Or maybe, maybe it was because of the, another church. Maybe because you, maybe you, maybe at one time you you belong to a church family that really hurt you, and you go, how can that be? It's impossible that a church family hurts me. No, it's not impossible. What do you think? Do you think in a church family we have nothing but angels floating around? No, that is impossible. No siree. Look around you. There ain't no angel in this room. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't no angel. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Elmer? You don't think she's your angel? <laughs> so you see what I'm saying? People, people get this idea that you're never going to be hurt by your, by your Christian family. No, you could be very, 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 very extremely hurt. That doesn't give you the right to walk away from, right? How many of you that have been married any, any time, any time, who's the youngest married in this room in time? Three years or less. Okay. How many years? <laughs> okay, I give up. <laughs> so he looks at me, is it two? <laughs> Okay, so between Stephen and you guys, three, two years like that. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. But I can guarantee you in those three or two years, I am sure one of the two hurt the other in, in, in a way or another, said something or did something that meant, hey, just because of that, I would hope and pray that you guys, and I'm putting you guys on the spot completely, and you guys, Stephen, back there on the spot, I hope and pray that you even thought, okay, I'm going to walk away from this commitment. Don't answer. I'm just saying. <laughs> so my point here is we're going to get hurt by those that love us. But you don't just walk away because of that. Selfishness is another one. Hey, here's the deal. What's in it for me? Huh? What's in this for me? I mean, I, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to be there. I'm going to attend uh, that congregation, or I am going to go ahead and, and commit to do that at church. But what's in it for me? In every area of life, and then, of course, you have the last one, which is complacency. What does that mean? Well, in a small definition, it's a sense of satisfaction. I've arrived. I'm, compl I'm complacent. I'm okay. I'm okay. Now, if you think you're okay, and I'm going to make a reference to marriages, if you think you're okay, gentlemen, most of the time, we're the ones who are complacent. We think everything is fine. If you really want to know how your marriage is, ask your wife. Just look at her and say, really, listen, I think we're doing amazing. Come on, baby, tell me. <laughs> if she tells you the truth, you're in for a rude awakening. Somehow women always have this radar. And this is not a marriage, but it's, it's a truth. So what it is is, man, a commitment continues, and it has to be stronger and stronger even during the difficult times. And so the point here is you can never be satisfied. Are you that satisfied with your commitment to God? I mean, think about what I just asked. Are you that satisfied? You think you've arrived? We, uh, that's it. I committed to God. I committed. Wh whatever it is you committed, are you that satisfied with it? And so that's what complacency is, and so that's why we don't continue. In fact, let me tell you, I believe this to be true. Look at this verse over here in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. This is what it says. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? I want you to know. Wake up. You're the runner. You're running. He's going, I, I never bought into this. It don't matter. You're alive. And you became a crowd. How many of you, how many of you said yes to Jesus one day? Okay, you joined their race. That's, that was your point right there. You join right there. All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. And so here's what it says. Run in such a way, and this is what Paul uses the analogy, run in such a way that you lose the race. Is that, did I misread that? Oh, I'm sorry, that you get the prize. So if you're running, and you know there's a goal, and you're running. Hey, listen, I don't know what my neighbors are doing. I don't know what they're not doing. By the way, that's called busybodies, meddling in people's affairs and lives. Hey, this is new, man. I just came up with this stuff. If I'm running and I'm committed to my race, I'm running in my lane. I ain't got time to look at what you're doing. I don't have time to see what you're not doing because if I am looking to the sides, I'm going to fall. I don't care at that moment. My responsibility is to my God and I'm staying in my lane and I'm running forward. And that's just the way it is. So run, man. Run. Stay in that commitment. Stay with it. Stay with that commitment. And so as we look at that, I'm thinking, a few weeks ago, Pastor Ryan 
unveil our new vision, which is? I was going to ask Carlos, what? For Miami. For, he's got it right on this shirt. For Miami. How do you think we are going to be for Miami? How do you think we're going to reach Miami? How do you think we're going to show Miami that we are the light and that we are the salt? How do you think this is going to happen? It's going to happen if we stay committed. It's going to happen if we say, man, we're going to go forward. We're going to go out. We're going to do what we have to do. We're going to help those that have just went through what they went through and continue to help. It doesn't have to be a storm. It doesn't have to be a, an earthquake. It doesn't have to be any of that for us to help one at a time. Amen. Commitment will help us to make that vision come true. And so there's many examples in the Bible, and one of which I'm bringing today as we start winding down to the end of this message, one that possibly most of you have heard of. His name is Joshua. Look what he says when it comes to commitment. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, that's exactly how he said then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Interesting. Man, who are you serving today? Do you realize that we have a lot of gods around us? Do you realize that some of us right now, whether we want to believe it or not, we're actually still serving gods that we used to serve before we came to know Jesus Christ. We made a commitment to Christ. We said we're going to follow you. We're going to deal with that in just a few minutes. We're going to follow you, Jesus. We love you. We're so grateful to you. But right now, we're still serving those same gods. Whether that be the God of money, whether that be uh, the God of social status, whether that be the God, whatever God that is, I don't know, but well, you're still stuck in serving that God. So Joshua was no different. His people were no different. As a matter of fact, read the entire chapter. It's a beautiful chapter where he goes and he describes what God had done for them. Man, this is what God did for you. He took you out of Egypt. He did this for us. He did this for us. But now that we're here, you choose then. Because I can't choose for you. You choose who you're going to serve. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm choosing for me and my family. That's all I can do. That's all you can do today. And by the way, this is a little side note, parenthesis. Gentlemen, if you are here and you're married or you're going to be married one day, God has said to you, to you, you are the leader of your home. You're the spiritual leader of that home. And because you are the spiritual leader of that home, then you better choose like Joshua to lead your family. And so this is what he told them. But interesting enough, the immediate context, and you know I'm, I'm big about context. The immediate context of this we find in the verses right before it. And so... He says this, as for me and, the, and my household, we will serve the Lord. And now the immediate, which is verses 13 and 14, look what it says here. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil. This is what I gave you. I gave you a land which did not toil. We sometimes get that wrong. Sometimes we think that what we have, here's what we said. Oh, I, 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 I swear to that. I sweated a lot this week, but it wasn't because of all heavens. Okay, air conditioning. It's God's amazing, amazing. <laughs> I don't know what to say. We are so blessed to be able to have it. And so we all sweat it. We all went through things, whether it was because of lack of air conditioning or outside cleaning or whatever. But, you know, we, we, we think, oh, it's all. No, 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 no. You know what? God gave you the strength to be where you are today. You got what you have because God gave you the life, the stamina, whatever it is you have, to be able to have what you have. And he says you did not build them and you live with them and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. I did that for you. You're done. You're alive because God has kept you and I alive. 
We are where we are in our walk of life, whether we are grateful for it or not, because God has brought us to this day right now. And so we move on and says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away, for God's sake, the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Recommit to what you said you were going to do. Do what you say you were going to do is what he's saying. And it's important because I'm going to show you, which I skipped, but I'm going to go back to it. So I'm going to drive the guys back there crazy. What I find to be an interesting definition of commitment. Now, you go to, uh, what is it, Webster's Dictionary, all that kind of stuff. You're going to have the amazing, amazing definition of, of, of commitment. And everybody has maybe a little one. But if, I don't know, Stephen, if you can make it back to, de- there you go. Definition of commitment. Listen to this. Doing the thing that you said you were going to do long after the circle of the word, the mood you said in, it in, has left you. And some of you are still analyzing it. Some of you are probably looking at it grammatically. I have no idea what kind of grammar it has. But listen to what it's saying. I mean, when you said the day you said, I commit to this, man, you were probably in some emotional euphoria. When you looked at your wife or your husband at the altar and you said, I will be with you until, until death kills you. <laughs> because when you say until death do us apart, you never think you're the one dying first. You're thinking, maybe you die. No, I'm sure not, right? Because you're in such love that you are probably at that day saying, oh my gosh, I could not breathe without you. Are you one of those that said that? I can't breathe if you're not there. Really? (laughs) But here's what I'm saying. Then you go forward. Okay, what was happening? What kind of mood was happening that day on your wedding day? What kind of mood was it? Oh my gosh, you couldn't keep your eyes off each other. You were so in love. It was like, oh. (sighs) Well, that has happened since then, right? Now you say, oh, but it's not because of that. he's, He's coming home. Oh. You see what I'm saying? But wait. According to this definition, what does commitment say? I don't care if I, if I am hating that you're coming home. I don't care if you yelled at me this morning. I don't care if I don't like you today. My commitment to you says, I will keep on going in your side because I said I do. <laughs> Did you say I do to God one day? I do, God. I do, and I will. I don't care what happens. I don't care if a storm comes my way. I don't care what's happening in my life. I don't care what changes. I don't care what mood I'm in today. I don't care if things just turn upside down. I said I do because I believe that you are the God and the creator. I believe you sent your son to die for me. I believe you sacrificed your only son for my salvation. And I do, God, till the day I die. That's commitment. And so we need to understand that. No matter what reasons we think we have. So we go back to Joshua now. And we find out what are some things that we need to recommit quickly. The first one is our wills. Now you got a will, don't you? Some of you have wills. And some of you have wills. I mean, there are some of you that are really... <laughs> I mean... My grandmother used to think I was, oh, she's like, oh, my gosh. You are so stubborn, so hard-headed. And, 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 and I was in many ways. I really was. Even later on in life, I realized I got myself in some really doozy troubles because I was so hard-headed and, and, and I was strong-headed and I was, until I met Judy. She straightened me out. So, but my point here is some of you are, right? Here's the deal. 
You have a will, and I have a will. But our wills need to be guided by a structure and by parameters. I have a will, but it's guided directly by the Word of God. My will is my will until God says, no way, Jose. No way. And if I really am totally committed to God, I don't care if that's what I want. I don't care if it hurts. I don't care if I desire it. I don't care what I think. I'm going to do whatever the Word of God says for me to do because it is God's will above mine. Greatest example of that was Jesus himself, wasn't he? You remember this verse? Matthew 26, 39. Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, as a man, Jesus was. He was saying, I'm not sure I want to die, especially that way. And that goes beyond that because he was also terribly afraid of that moment where God the Father would have to turn his face on, away from him and the loneliness. So really, honestly, I believe as a man, he was asking for that. If there's any other way you can do it, hey, listen, I know you, I know you love these people. And I know that I came to save that which was lost. I know all that, but couldn't you save them a different way? I mean, could, I mean, couldn't you just do what you did in, in the Old Testament? Remember what he did in the Old Testament? He sent a few drops of water, and that was it? Couldn't you do that again and make sure that this time Adam and Eve doesn't eat the apple? That's publicly wrong? No, he said, but, and here's what he did. He took his will and put it right on God's will, and he said, not as I will, but as you will. That's the greatest example of, of putting our will under God and saying, no matter what. And that's what Joshua was saying. As for me and my house, we're going to serve who? The Lord. What is a will? It's a process of decision. That's all it is. The will is a process of making decisions. And so if I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to make it according to what God says. And that's how my will processes that. Now, what I have to understand let me ask you guys, do you understand the commitment that some of you I know, hopefully all of you, made a commitment one day to God, a strong commitment. You made a commitment when you got saved. If you are saved, one day you accepted Jesus Christ. If you're willing to say, I know Jesus is my Savior, then you made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Thank God that your salvation and mine doesn't depend on our commitment. Thank God for that. Because he keeps us saved. Thank God for that. But we made a commitment to him. If you and I can say that today, then we need to understand what we were saying when we said it. And if we didn't understand it, I'm sorry. I'm going to mess you up today. Because I'm going to tell you exactly what you did when you made that commitment. So look at this verse with me really quick. It says, if anyone desires to come after me, you don't anybody here desires to come after Jesus? <laughs> You're afraid of that. Where are we going with this? Listen, let me, put it, let me put it this way. How many of you know for sure, we should be on a shadow of a doubt, that when you die, you're going to heaven? Okay, that's a done deal. This right here is a done deal. You went ahead and went after him. Now, here's what he says. First, let him deny himself. Then, well, let me read the whole verse first. Come back. Second, and take up his cross daily. And third, follow me. But wait, follow me is supposed to be what we're already doing. So the first two are in question here. We think we're following him. But we're skipping the whole idea of denying ourselves and taking up our cross. So it's okay. I'm good. I mean, I'm cool. I'm following Jesus, but I ain't denying myself. I'm, I'm following Jesus, but I'm not taking no cross. It's all, it's all good, Jesus, I'm following you. Well, let's understand quickly what that really means. Denying ourselves, the denying part comes from a Greek word that actually means to disown. And it's the same word that was used of Israel diso disowning Jesus. 
So the idea of disowning, what it really means is in reference to making disowning your sinful nature, saying no to your desires, saying no to that which in your heart and in your desires you want to do and you know it's contrary to God, it's disowning that and saying, I will deny that, I will not do it, even though I get up every morning with the desire to do it. That's tough. That is tough. So every morning I get up with the desire to drink coffee. I could only come up with that. Only because that was one of the things that, that happened. That towards the middle of the week after uh, we got electricity, I, we thought, oh, well, thank God. Now I got to go to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> oh, no, it was open. But it was worse than that. They went selling coffee <laughs> because of the water contamination. They were like, we walked in there and go, oh, we have all kinds of food but no coffee. I wanted to die. <laughs> that's, that's like my drug. How can I? It's specifically from Dunkin' Donuts. So I'm just saying, every morning I get up and I have to have coffee. I mean, that's just, that's how I say it. I don't have to. I'm not going to die, but I feel like I'm going to die. Imagine if I had to die myself and just say no coffee ever again. Well, that's just nothing compared to what God is asking you to deny your desires for, but yet we just won't. Because this is what we say. Oh, but my desire is so big. It's so amazing. It's so overwhelming what I desire to do. Although I know it's wrong. Although I know it's against God. But I desire it so much that God has to understand. No, God doesn't have to understand if he said no, it's no. How many of us, or how many of you guys, especially some of you young uh, people that have children, how many times do you tell your children no? <laughs> as, 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 as a young parent, I remember uh, no, one time no wasn't enough, was it? No. 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 If I have to say it one more time, that's the funniest one. Because <laughs> by the time you just say that, you have said it 15 times, then there's always that one more time. Your kids look at you like, you're crazy. They just know. They just know you're going to say no. No, it's a thing to say. And ultimately, this has nothing to do with parenting, but this is what kids do. They know how to wear you down. And they know that after a while, you can say no, 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 until you get so tired of saying, okay. <laughs> and that's all that we're waiting for. I don't, they don't care. That's commitment, my friend. <laughs> that's commitment right there. So deny yourself. And then we move on from there, and we go on to take up his cross daily. Now wait, here's the problem. A lot of us have taken that, that phrase out of context, and we use it on a day. In fact, people that don't care about God use it. And here's what they do. They look at each other, they look at their spouse, and they go, that's my cross right there. <laughs> that's a daily cross, Raul. You're done. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, Elmer... You're a really big cross. You see what I'm saying? And people look at that. And people go around, you know what my cross is? This pain, I, this is my cross. Or, or this situation is my cross. Or, or my mother-in-law is a big old cross. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? That's not at all what that's talking about. Not at all. Remember, don't take a verse out of context. But more importantly also, don't take it out of history. So when, when, the, when the listeners were listening, when Jesus said that, then they heard the word cross, they weren't thinking about their mother-in-law. You know what they were thinking? The cross is a horrendous death. It was a death for criminals. It was the worst kind of death there ever was. It was the biggest thing that could happen to an individual. And Jesus said, you need to be willing to die physically. You need to be willing to go through anything you have to go through, even the death of the cross, the worst of the worst, for me. That's what he was saying. And then if you're willing to do that, then you, have, then you can go ahead and follow me, which he says, and follow me, it's a daily pattern. It's something that you do daily. That's the first one. The second, as we move along, because we're running out of time, it's our finances. And some of you right now are thinking, yeah, but here we go. Yeah, okay, so I'll get you out of that mode. We're not talking about tithe and offerings, although that's part of it. 
but we're talking about our possessions. We're talking about what we believe is ours. We need to understand that part of that commitment to God is committing that everything we own is really His. It's not even the 10%. It's not even the whatever offering we give. No, no, no. It's not that. It's everything we own is His. And so when we commit, we have to commit with our finances because it really shows God where you stand because God already knows your heart. He knows my heart. But boy, when we have a difficult time taking a dollar out of our wallet to give for a need, God knows exactly where you stand. And so when we understand that, look at some of these verses that I just write them down Memorize them. I don't know. But these are just principles. There are many principles, but we don't have time to go through all of them. But listen to, uh, no, I want to I go back to Matthew 6, 24. If we can pull it up up here. In Matthew 6, 24, it says, cannot serve God in money. Now, that's not the whole verse. That's just there. Listen, cannot. How many here want to serve God? Okay, you cannot serve money. Do I have a problem with that? Cannot serve God and money. Cannot. No, here's not, there's not a possibility. Understand what I'm saying. There is no possibility. You either serve one or the other, but you cannot serve both. Move on to the next one. No, the next one, 12, 15. Luke 12, 15, look what it says. Life does not consist in what? Your life does not consist of how much money or how much possession or how big is your house or how, how many things you have or how many boats or how many whatever it is that society says that's important for you to have. Hey, listen to what I'm saying. Either you go by what God says or by what society says. Life is not, it doesn't consist of an abundance of possessions. You do realize that you're going to die. Right? When? Anybody knows? In the first service, I saved for $5,000, I can tell you. <laughs> Nobody took me. <laughs> Nobody took my, my... Hey, listen, only God knows, right? Then why are you spending what is really precious with you, which, which is your time, your life, in accumulating what somebody else is going to enjoy the day they stick you in the ground? You go, how do you know that? Because the Bible says it. The Bible says that some stranger is going to live it up with your money. You go, no, they're not, because I'm doing a will. Yeah, well, that's good. But maybe your kids was going to get married to somebody you don't like. Or you would have not liked. And now that you're dead, they're going to do it faster. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Because you're like, I'm young, I don't think about those things. Think what I, about what I just said. Look, 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 look. 1 Timothy 6.10, look what it says. Everybody knows this one. Everybody knows 1 Timothy. For the love of money is what? Root, right there. Not money, the love of it. Because people confuse that. They go, well, does that mean a Christian needs to be poor? No. Not at all. Is it wrong to, to have a car? No. Is it wrong to have two cars? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to have three cars? No, as long as you can give it to me when I need it. <laughs> Is it wrong to have a boat? Absolutely not, because you know what? I don't want to deal with a boat, but I can certainly ride in yours. <laughs> Is it wrong to have a big house? No, if you think you need to have a big house, have a big house. It's more to clean, but have a big house. You, oh, I don't care what you have. If God blesses you with it, no, 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 no. It's, what's wrong is the love of all of that. What's wrong is saying, I've got all that, and this is mine, I'm not sharing. Oh, I got all this money, this is mine, I'm not giving it away. No, 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 that's what makes it wrong. Love of, love of, okay? So kind of all kinds of evil. Now, look at this first, really quick, and then we'll move on to our final point. In 2 Corinthians 9, 11, you will be enriched in every way. Now, let me stop right there. You will be enriched in every way. There is no doubt about that. Paul is telling the church, and you go back and do your research on that particular chapter, you're going to find out that Paul is talking about their giving. And this is a church that was going through tribulation and all kinds of stuff. And he told them, 
God is going to enrich you. Now wait, how many rich people do we have in the room? And you are basing that upon, can I have your taxes? No. Here's the deal. Probably, even those of you that say you're rich, if you show your income to the general population by the standards of the general population, you may, may be at middle class, may be at a maybe class. That means you don't even know if you're middle, upper, lower. You're just there. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. It's just this, right? But here's the deal. Who are you going to believe? Society or God? So if God says you will be enriched, now I'll ask the question again. How many rich people in the room? All of us are. Because you have what you have. I have what I have because that's what God wants us to have at this moment. And as far as God is concerned, you're rich and I'm rich. And what I have is enough to give to you. What I have is enough to help out during this time. What I have is enough to go down to the Keys or to, to go down to Naples or, or go to Houston and help out those in need. What I have is enough. And as I do that, he does it so that we can be what? What's the word? Generous on every, every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. For those out there that are receiving on the behalf of God, they're going to thank God because you and I don't give so that we can receive the glory, but that God receives the glory. And so it says in verse 10, this is important. If we go back to verse 10, if we can find it back there, this is the verse I added at the last minute. It says this, Honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new what? Uh, for some of you, that's, a, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's an important point right there. You want new wine? There you go. You got it. Which, by the way, new wine is not fermented. Uh, too bad. So that's, that's the point right there. And then you will have, verse 11, plenty to do what? To be generous. That's the key right there. Final and last point, our futures. How many here have a future? You better, <laughs> okay? You better have a future. And listen, here's what I'm saying. The Lord says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean on to, to your own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And as we put our lives into his guidance, we now trust him with all of our faith, with all of our mind. We know we have a future. I just don't know what's going to happen in it. Period. We don't know. Things just change from minute to minute. I make reference again to these storms. Maybe two, three weeks ago, hey, nobody, everybody, most of us were probably thinking, oh, it's almost over. I know we're peaking. I know we're peaking, but after the peak, oh, okay, November comes along and no more storms. We made it one more time. Ten years. Now today, we're facing disaster in many areas. Who knew? We don't know that. But I'm going to trust with all my heart because my God loves me. And in the midst of the storm, he can calm the storm. He is there. In the midst of everything, he is there. And I am going to trust him with all my heart. And so, I see self-surrender there. Because when it says, lean not into your understanding, it's surrendering my future, surrendering my will, surrendering my life, surrendering everything, self-surrender. But I also see active faith. Active faith says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. So, I have a will. Remember the will? Surrendering your will? But you know what? I want to do this, but the Bible says no, so I'm not going to do it. And don't get it confused. Some people say, you know, maybe if, if, maybe if I was a better Christian, I would just not desire to do that. Don't get confused. Remember, we're, 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 there's, there's sin. There's sin. And just because you desire something doesn't mean that, that this is wrong at the moment. It just means that desire is there. What makes it a sin is when you follow through with it. 
Just because you say, but the desire comes back, listen, that doesn't make you a bad person. That just makes you like one of us, the rest of us. But we have to continue to the commitment. Commitment to the Word of God. Commitment to the Word of God. Commitment to the Word of God. Giving ourselves full faith, man. You believe? Do you believe that our God can do it all things? Can change all things? Now let me tell you, there's a long, a long time ago, there's a story I read. It's a little dummy story. It was this guy with a wheelbarrow that was wanting to cross the Niagara Fall on a rope. And he was saying to everybody, hey, 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 do you believe I can do this? I believe I can do this. You believe I can do this? I believe you know, the guy was saying. And so he's standing there at the beginning of the rope, and, and everybody's just looking at him. And all of a sudden, this guy that was sitting next to him, I think you can do it. Man, I bet that you can do it. You can do it. He's telling the guy with the bear, wheelbarrow. And the guy with the wheelbarrow turns to him and says, okay, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> That's where things change, my friend. That's where things change. We got a big mouth, but we're not willing to show for. If I say, hey, man, our God is great. Hallelujah. Our God can heal. Hallelujah. Our God can take, can keep us. Hallelujah. 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 But when I say, get in the wheelbarrow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it loud. Say it with me. Hallelujah. Get in the wheelbarrow, man. Get in the wheelbarrow. If you believe with all of your heart and you follow that commitment, you say that commitment, that just means you're going to stay in that wheelbarrow. You're going to let God do the guiding. And that's all there is to it. Let's stay committed. Let's pray.